everyone. So now we have Colleen Walters presenting you on Container Linux with RHEL. Thank you. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, looks good. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to start my talks. Why, why am I here in front of you presenting on this stage? Uh, to me, uh, I joined Red Hat because free software in particular is really important to me. And when I was listening to Chris's talk this morning, I was just thinking about just why diversity in particular, you know, why is that important to us? Software today is just fundamental to a society. It's just a layer that underlines everything, right? And I think Richard Stallman in, particularly, in particular was incredibly visionary in not accepting proprietary printer drivers, right? And now, now just think about you know, how fundamental the cell phone and computers are to our life, right? Free and open source software are just fundamental, right? And I, I also, in particular, just love working in the free and open source software community, collaborating with people and companies across the world. It's, it's really great. Um, and I think Red Hat's a great place, great place to do that. So, um, so that's why I'm here. Uh, why... And I, I, want, I want you to think about that, you know, what motivates me. But in this talk, what I hope to get you is the motivation behind a lot of fundamental changes we're making for OpenShift 4.0 and after Red Hat acquired CoreOS. What are, what are the themes? What are the things that we're trying to change? That's what I hope you'll, you'll get out of this talk. So when I submitted the talk, it was based on one that was given at the Red Hat Summit by Brandon Phillips, CTO of CoreOS, and Ben Briard, who's a PM at Red Hat. Uh, works on containers, and so the the original version, uh, Brandon Phillips gives a lot of good motivation for what drove CoreOS, and uh, Ben gives a lot of background about uh, on the Red Hat side. So I'm going to give a lot, hopefully give you some more detail today uh, on the merger of these things. So before we look at the road ahead, we kind of have to look backwards a little bit. Like what was the road that got us here? Obviously, Docker sort of encapsulated Linux containers in a way that was very compelling. Linux containers have existed for a long time, but Docker packaged it in a command line interface and tooling and, and added some concepts like the container images that really just struck a spark, right? It was a model that worked and it just, a level of usability that hadn't quite been captured before. And after that, where we started to see, so uh, I helped create Red Hat Atomic Host, um, which is you know a container optimized version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, when I say, when I abbreviate CL, that's short for container Linux, I should have spelled it out there. Uh, and just a brief background on that. So originally it was called CoreOS, but then CoreOS, the company, grew to have multiple products and uh, Container Linux basically became one of CoreOS, the operating system, got renamed to Container Linux uh, because they also created Tectonic, which is a distribution of Kubernetes and other things. One thing I find surprising is sometimes Container Linux and Atomic Host are sort of used in the same sen sentence as Rancher and Linux Kit and things like that. And just it's interesting to me because they're on one very high level similar, but on the, the technical level, very, very different. Rancher and Linux Kit both say, okay, well, you run containers on top of the OS. Why doesn't the OS itself, uh, why isn't the operating system itself assembled out of containers? And I thought about this a lot, and I just, it's too fundamental a change. It doesn't, and I, I, I struggle to see the, actually the value in doing that, and I, I think Rancher is starting to switch back. But I won't dive too much into that. Um, just that's part of the history of these things. And obviously, after Docker, Kubernetes came along. And Kubernetes, you know, there's the orchestration battle. And Kubernetes, I think everyone would agree, is sort of won, for the most part, that orchestration battle. I mean, you, you will see people debate, what should I do at the small scale? Uh, I had a customer ask me at Summit, you know, I have two computers in a branch office, should I use Kubernetes? interesting uh, discussion, but obviously at the large scale, you know, we have distributions of Kubernetes. There are a lot of them. Uh, OpenShift is Red Hat's distribution of Kubernetes. Tectonic, we acquired from CoreOS, and it's actually really interesting because OpenShift had a very strong developer focus. There's a lot of added objects. So when we say OpenShift is Kubernetes, 
You can literally use the kubectl command line with it. You know everything you saw in the previous talk. But there are additional API objects. So it has builds, it has routes, which predate ingress and things like that. Um, Tectonic had a lot of components that were very operator focused. So the union of these things makes a lot of sense because it, you got all the advantages of the developer focus of OpenShift with all the operator focus of the core OS technologies. And that's and it's mostly the operator uh, when I say operator here, I'm actually more mean system administrator. It's confusing because there's also operators, which I'll talk about later. Uh, all right. So, like I mentioned, it's actually really interesting because Container Linux and Atomic Host had a lot of architectural alignment points. Atomic Host, we say, okay, we're going to take all the Red Enterprise Linux components, you know, the RPMs, and bake them together in a different delivery format. And Container Linux is very much similar to that for Gentoo. It's taking Gentoo eBuilds and providing a service based on those eBuilds. And it's not Container Linux is derived from Gentoo, but it's not really exposed that it's Gen 2. And uh, that's sort of true of Atomic Host as well. Um, and they also, yeah, they come out of the box with this similar alignment points. So uh, one of the biggest things that started with is basically this idea of transactional or image-based updates, right? In the previous talk, in Chris's talk, and if you use Kubernetes, you've realized the value in having image-based updates for your applications, right? But having that sort of thing for your operating system is really valuable because it means you, you know you can go to a particular state. One of the things that happened later in the evolution of these things is we started to design ways to extend the operating system. So you have this concept of a base operating system image, right? I have this thing just like an application is at this point. One of the tricky parts, though, is that not, and I'll talk more about this later, is not everything goes to the same life cycle. So in Container Linux, uh, there's this component called Torx, which is basically like a kind of boot time add-on management. So it's intended to still be immutable infrastructure style. You boot into the OS and you add things on it, but you don't ever remove them or have them drift over time. Uh, in Red Enterprise Linux Atomic Host, and actually in uh, Red Enterprise Linux in general, we have this concept of system containers, which are a way to boot, define bootstrap containers. Um, and at the top of Ghost also has package layering, which I won't talk about today too much. One of the most important takeaways, and this is the number one thing that we're changing right now, is that in both Container Linux and Tectonic, right? So you, you have a series of layers. You have Container Linux. It's a base operating system with the container image. It has Docker. And on top of that, you would install Tectonic, which is Kubernetes, right? So they naturally... Well, we support them moving at different life cycles. And the same was true with Red Enterprise Linux and Red, Red Enterprise Linux Atomic Host and Red Enterprise Linux in general and OpenShift, right? You install an operating system and then you install Kubernetes on top, right? So, yeah, I'll dive into this more in the next slide. So this has been a real, really big challenge for us uh, over time because we tried to create this separation for a good reason. You, you don't want to, you want to update your operating system, right? You, you know, the next meltdown, Spectre comes out. You want to be able to update your operating system and have that apply to all those containers, right? But a lot of people, pretty much no one wants to just have their Kubernetes installation or their OpenShift installation just change day to day, right? That's something you want to plan for. That's something you want to control. And the so we try to support that by having the operating system and the cluster Kubernetes operate using different technologies at different life cycles. The problem is, though, there's actually a lot of interlinkage between those. So the kubelet is the part of Kubernetes that actually talks to Docker and runs containers. It also does a bunch of other things that Docker doesn't do. Um, and basically, today, the kubelet tries to talk to that engine. So the engine is shipped by the operating system. And that Docker engine, or the container engine, could be Cryo2, uses SE Linux, which is very much a part of the host, right? So we have this linkage across all those things. Another good example that the Kubelet handles today is storage, right? So it can provision Ceph volumes and things like that. Well, Ceph has a kernel module, right? So we have this kind of linkage from the high level all the way down. And this is 
Uh, today in Red Enterprise Linux, this is very visible in the fact that we have the Red Enterprise Linux base channels, right? That's the base operating system. And originally we said, okay, well that's a little bit too slow for the container engine. Let's let's create extras. So now we have two repositories, right? You can install Docker from extras, and then OpenShift is a layer on top. And then we have multiple levels of supported OpenShift versions crossed with multiple versions of the operating system and the extras repository in there. It's very, very complicated to manage. Now obviously, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, OpenShift Ansible handles some of this for you, but there's no getting out of the inherent complexity in all this. Uh, and we can't have a lot of bootstrapping models. How do we, how do you bootstrap from that single node OS into Kubernetes? So I'm going too slowly, so I gotta speed up. One thing that is interesting about container links is basically there's a single stream. You want container, actually, uh, just a random question here. How many people have used container Linux today? A couple, a couple, okay. So, yeah, it's a very streamlined user experience, right? You install the OS, it comes out of the box with automatic updates, and that's really it. Like, that's part of the idea, is you don't think about the operational complexity of an operating system. You just install it, and the team, I think, did a really good job of keeping track of the latest versions of different upstream components. So the Linux kernel is one of the biggest ones, and a challenge has definitely been regressions in the upstream kernel but also keeping track of the latest system D. Uh, but a challenge for container links was Docker, because again, Docker is tied to, SC, uh, tied to Kubernetes. So how do you lifecycle those? Um, where it's a lot more complex for Atomic Host, because at Red Hat, we previously had three distributions, Fedora, CentOS, and Red Hat Linux. Now we actually have four, because container links is part of the family. Uh, and that made talking about Atomic Host a lot more complex, having these three things. Uh, but it is one of the mo most powerful benefits, in my opinion, of containers. I mean, there's a lot. Again, in the previous talk, you saw a lot of benefits of Kubernetes. But keeping that host operating system up to date, making sure that, okay, you know, the next, again, next specter comes out, you see that come in, and you don't have to think about, okay, well, I have these rel 5 boxes over here, I have these six ones, how do I want to test that? Put all that stuff in containers and keep the host up to date is a really, really powerful model. Okay, so that was the background, and what I want to talk about is the road ahead. So the road ahead is a little bit more complicated than container links. So we're going to create, we're in the process of creating Fedora Core OS and Red Hat Core OS. So we're carrying forward this two distribution, two stream thing to try and fulfill, to try and deal with the fact that we have different audiences, right? And before all this stuff, we had Fedora and a Red Enterprise Linux, and they target different audiences, different use cases. If you want to participate in the development, we point you to Fedora, it moves faster um, for long-term operational stability about Red Enterprise Linux. Some of that is going to continue. So, Fedora Core OS is in progress. Uh, it's going to be a successor to Container Linux in 2019. Container Linux, will, again, if you're running it today, don't panic. We're gonna, it's going to have a, a long life cycle into next year. But the idea is Fedora Core OS, we want to preserve that experience and move forward. Whereas, and, and it'll feel like Container Linux. Like you install the operating system, you have a container engine, you can you know, do what you want after that. Whereas in contrast, we are totally changing what we're doing with Red Enterprise Linux, Atomic Host, and OpenShift, where we're merging the CoreOS technologies into what we call Red Hat CoreOS, and this will solely be targeted for OpenShift use cases. So rather than having this idea, okay, well, I'm going to provision the operating system, then I provision the cluster on top, we really come out of the box with a very opinionated model for OpenShift and Kubernetes. OpenShift, which is Kubernetes. And again, I should emphasize, if you just want the Kubernetes aspects, OpenShift is Kubernetes. Now, we're having a lot of discussions about how exactly Red Hat CoreOS will work and what its relationship with Red Hat Plus Linux will be. Uh, the way I'm thinking of things now is we want to orbit Red Hat Plus Linux, but we do want... We want to move faster in a lot of cases. So, a good example is tracing and debugging, right? A compelling value is 
maybe some of you out there have applications that are you've built on top of Red Enterprise Linux 6. Today, you can put that in a container, Red Enterprise, run it on a Red Enterprise Linux 7 host, but tracing and debugging is advancing rapidly in the upstream Linux kernel. So if you want to use um, the BPF-based tracing stuff, you know, new cutting-edge stuff to debug your old Red Enterprise Linux-based app, you know, we want to have a faster-moving host where you have all those newest features and you can have your applications stay stable. So that's that's part of the idea. Uh, so there's a couple core ingredients. So what do we actually mean when we say we're merging the core OS container Linux technologies with the Red, Red Hat technologies? Uh, one of the number one things from the core OS container Linux side is this ignition tool. So previously, it's worth looking at a comparison with Red Enterprise Linux. There you have Kickstart, which is usually a way to provision bare metal machines. You can use it to provision cloud images too, although that's more unusual. More popular in the cloud environment is this project called CloudInit. And Ignition is targeted for both these use cases. Use it for bare metal, use it for cloud, and it differs a lot from cloud in it, and then it's a boot once configuration. So you pass it a configuration, and either it succeeds or fails. If it fails, your machine does not boot, and you can see the f you you can trace the failure in a you know a console log. It's usually it's best to have your ignition configs tested locally, and then before you scale them out. But one of the fundamental flaws of cloud in it is that it runs on each boot, and so you can have your system state sort of drift over time if you change the cloud init configuration. And again, a whole part of this philosophy is at a scale out model, you don't want pets systems or systems that drift in state, right? So Ignition, it's a boot once config tool. Uh, and it has a lot of more powerful features because it runs in the initial RAM disk, so it can provision disk, it can change your partitioning and, and things like that. Um, and for both Fedora Core OS and Red Hat Core OS, hopefully Red Hat Core OS, so that's a tricky, trickier one, I'll get to that later. We wanna, I think one of the things we messed up with with Atomic Host was not having automatic updates on by default. Yes, we have a transactional update system, but I think it's really a powerful mental shift where you go to a model where updates are actually automatic. Like, you don't think about them, you can have control over them, right? But just having them on by default is, is a fundamental difference. So we're gonna, we have some, some work on basically polishing the OS tree layer, which we're going to carry forward into the merge core OS. But I'd like fewer operators to have to think about it. Again, I like that mental model where you provision the operating system and it just updates. And if something goes wrong, you can roll back. You have visibility and control into it. And there's a lot of other things that we're, we're merging together. So from the core OS side, there's a strong commitment to security. Right? It, it's just it's fundamental to what we do, and that's also true at Red Hat. And containers, obviously, uh, common. And we want you to be able to manage it. And one of the things we actually just recently accomplished is getting Ignition with SE Linux enforcing mode. So Container Linux has SE Linux, but it defaults to permissive, which might as well not be on, because if you try and turn on, there's a lot of traps. So uh, we actually just finally got Ignition working with SE Linux, which was fairly tricky because it runs very early in the boot process. And again, that philosophy of immutable infrastructure, where you provision your systems and they stay that way, and the concept of the operating system as a cluster, which is mostly taken over now by Kubernetes. I'm gonna get into that later. I just need to check how much time I have. How much, uh, how much time do I have? Sorry. Yeah, Dan's telling me it's lunch time. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go pretty quickly over this because I think I only have a couple minutes left and I wanna get to a demo. So we're discussing, if you're interested in participating in development, and again, you know, to me, free software is important, working in a community is really important. So uh, if you're interested in participating, what's the future of Fedora CoreOS and transitively the future of Red Hat CoreOS because we want one to derive from the other. Uh, we have a tracker issue where we're discussing a lot of different things. So for example, container layers come with, comes with network D, uh, whereas in most Fedora derived derivatives, we use network manager. Uh, and one of the things that container Linux simplifies a lot is they don't really have an installer per se. You just have a disk image and you DD it, you know, copy as an image direct to a disk. Uh, whereas with Atomic Host, we just reused Anaconda, which means we had Kickstart and a lot of choice. Uh, where we, we, I think we've sort of come to a conclusion where we want to, again, be more opinionated about the installer. The, in particular, the partitioning layout, less choice there. 
a lot of discussion about how do we ship Docker, um, and you know, do, how do we manage host updates outside of a Kubernetes context? Uh, update lifecycle and cadence is one of the biggest and trickiest issues, so we're discussing all those things. Okay, so let me dive down into a little more detail in the Red Hat CoreOS side. So I just talked about common ingredients across both, although there will be some differences. The biggest, by far the biggest change, and I mentioned this before, for Red Hat CoreOS is that the kubelet will be part of the host, will have everything you need to run OpenShift versioned and lifecycled with the operating system. So again, rather than that two-phase install, it'll just be there, and there won't be a kind of bootstrap phase where you have to maybe install a different version of Docker or something like that. A lot of work went into the CoreOS Tectonic installer. It's actually very different from what was developed for OpenShift, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences in a minute. But the next generation installer, again, is going to be a lot more opinionated. It's going to derive significantly from the Tectonic installer. It'll use Ignition and manage the host install to a far greater degree than the OpenShift Ansible version. And here's one of the biggest parts uh, that you know I, I'll be working on. So I'm an operating systems guy. I've been working on updating operating systems, not consistently, but I've been in that area mostly for over 15 years now. So uh, yeah, and when I say, so briefly a brief background on operator. An operator is a way to define a way to manage an application like it was part of Kubernetes itself. And there's, there's a lot more detail on the CoreOS operator page. But the idea here is that the operating system update itself, the, really the operating system itself should feel like a Kubernetes object. And uh, the CoreOS guys basically wrote some code that I'm going to demo later if I don't run out of time for managing those operating system updates. So again, It'll be automated on by default, but very controlled. So you'll be able to use kubectl to control the operating system update. Uh, another change that we're making is basically taking this OS3 concept, which is like the operating system image, we're actually sticking, it's a different format than container images for various reasons. It has SA Linux where container images don't. Um, or no, I won't go into that. But the idea is we'll basically mirror, encapsulate that operating system update itself in a container, which is another part of making the operating system feel itself like a container. And one of the biggest things, once you scale this out, I was just talking about updates, but actually how do you manage the configuration of all your machines? So building on top of Ignition and, and tools and technologies from CoreOS, we'll have a machine configuration operator that's making sure that as you... Uh, schedule a change for your systems, whether that's networking related or uh, cryptographic. Maybe you decide to change a system cryptographic policy, right? That's one. We're, what we're working is basically saying, okay, we can apply this change directly to your machine, and if we can't, we'll be able to take down the machines and do a rolling reprovision. So all this is going to be integrated with Kubernetes itself. So we drain the node and you know get all the containers off and have a sort of seamless update. And, and kind of moving away from, again, it's immutable infrastructure, any kind of container drift. And we're likely going to come out of the box with Podman or Cryo only. So this may be uh, one of the bigger differences between Red Hat CoreOS and Fedora CoreOS because Fedora CoreOS, I think it would be very traumatic not to ship a binary called Docker, uh, certainly for anyone transitioning from container Linux. But uh, again, for, for OpenShift, for, for Red Hat CoreOS, we don't want you logging into the nodes too much. You know, the idea is you're up maintaining everything through Kubernetes. You hopefully don't need to care too much what's underneath the hood except for the cryo features, so uh, we'll probably come out of the box cryo only. So it's worth talking briefly about uh, the other path. So we aren't only going to support Red Hat CoreOS for OpenShift installs. There are a lot of valid use cases where you need to install OpenShift on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux as it exists today. And this will very much definitely be supported. Uh, the OpenShift Ansible code base, which is, I think last I heard one of the larger Ansible code bases out there, is going to continue and it will be used to handle the kind of bring your own. I, I have a custom, custom requirements. I don't want to make this leap to Red Hat CoreOS. 
you'll be able to use OpenShift Ansible. Can, it'll feel very similar. Although it's likely that some parts of OpenShift Ansible with, will converge with some parts of the former Tectonic installer because there's a lot of overlapping concerns around you know, provisioning certificates, all these types of things. Um, there's always a sort of core tension with OpenShift Ansible because Ansible is trying to define a cluster state, but then Kubernetes is also trying to do that. So again, one way to think about it here with Red Hat Core OS is that Kubernetes takes over that role. Uh, yep. Okay, so let me check. I don't have too much time, but let me just briefly show, talk a little bit about a demo. So this is code ported from Container Linux that's talking to RPM OS tree from Atomic Host. So it's streamlining operating system updates. And again, the core problem here is if you just type yum update on a machine or RPM OS tree upgrade, you really actually want to like make sure the machine has its containers. Well, you want to manage the reboots. Have the containers, the update drain the machine, have the containers move to other, other hosts, and have everything basically be coordinated. You don't want all your hosts to reboot at once. And that's basically what this code is doing here. So what you just saw, let me pause this right here. So one of the most important aspects here is, is again, Kubernetes is controlling the operating system update. So in this code, managing the update state is annotations on the node object in Kubernetes. And what you can see here is basically the operator, there, there's a node agent that runs on each node, and it's updating these annotations and saying, okay, I have an update, I need reboot, do I need to reboot or not? And we also add a little bit of metadata around versioning. So this will allow a web interface to say, okay, across my whole cluster, what are the versions of the individual hosts, right? In a very natural Kubernetes-focused way, right? Again, all that state's maintained in etcd. Um, and basically what this operator is doing, let me see if I can skip ahead to a uh, more interesting part. So here we're deploying the operator. And again, the, the, the operating system update is just part of Kubernetes. Let's see. Yeah, so here, this is demoing running the RPM Mostry status command, which is showing me on an individual node, the version and diving into a package diff. Um, but if you want to look at the logs, you know, why is maybe you want to, you're trying to debug why a particular node isn't updating, you can actually use uh, the kubectl logs to look at that operator. So rather than having, you know, something like, okay, I got to SSH into this machine and look at syslog or journal CTL, it's all part of your, your cluster. And, and basically the idea is right now it's fairly hard coded in that only one node will go down for reboot at a time. Obviously, a lot of you want to control this uh, in a much more sophisticated way. This thing's actually not really an operator in that sense right now, in that it doesn't have a lot of configuration itself. So uh, that's one of the things we're going to be enhancing is adding a lot more significant control over this. You know, so you know, if you have 500 nodes, you can obviously have more than one reboot at a time in most cases. Uh, so I won't go through this whole demo because again, I, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, Yep. So that was a demo of container Linux ported code, which is integrated with Kubernetes. But for Red Hat Core OS, it's actually going to be a much higher level cluster operator that controls those updates because it, it'll be very integrated with the machine configuration and saying, okay, I need to reconcile this ignition configuration and make sure that this node uh, goes is in this particular state. It's about yeah configuration plus operating system version, which combines to form the cluster. Okay, so in summary, it's a lot of technology from CoreOS container links that we're merging together with Red Hat technologies. And definitely, I think it's sort of too bad that some things are going to become more complex. Because again, I really like that simplicity of container links today, that concept that there's only a single stream, you get it, and you install it, and you know, you, the updates just go in the background. Um, but I think the, the new split will actually be worth it because we're, we're trying to, again, manage both uh, multiple audiences. But the number one change we're making here is OpenShift installations, which if any of you have tried to do it, it's not hard, but there's a lot of things that we're making dramatically simpler here. Uh, and I can go in, yeah, again, not too much time, so I'm going to more detail. So that is about all. Are there any questions here?
back. Or, okay. Yeah, so uh, you see Fedora Coral West as having other uses than OpenShift. Is OpenShift Origin going to be using Fedora Coral West? Uh, is there... Yeah, okay, so the question is about Fedora Core OS and other uses, and what about OpenShift on top? That's a very complicated question. What we said so far in the fact is that we want, we definitely want to support people using upstream Kubernetes uh, on Fedora Core OS. That's a very valid use case. Um, and the degree to which as we'll work on supporting a kind of true scale-out enterprise thing on top of Fedora CoreOS, unlikely. Our product focus is going to be on Red Hat CoreOS. But, you know, if you want to play around with containers, you want to do a small-scale thing, you want to do something custom, everything we do will be free and open source, and we'd like Fedora CoreOS to be where you enter things. So can we be able to run OpenShift Origin on Fedora CoreOS? I think we'll probably make that work, but you may lose out on some things like the operator-based updates. Like I, because I, we've definitely learned that if you want to support this at scale, you really want you really need to have everything tested and versioned together. Whereas with Fedora Core OS, we're kind of still maintain that container Linux model of the operating system and engine will move forward, and you can do something else, uh, do what you want on top, and that will continue to work. Right? There's a lot of technologies that manage that work on top of container links today to manage Kubernetes. We're, gonna, we're not going to break those, that's for sure. Yeah. There's another question in the back. So, so these uh, over-the-wire updates are for Kubernetes specifically, right? Um, I saw a presentation by Brandon about the operator framework. So is that related to this stuff? or? Okay, yep. So the question was about the operator-based OS updates and the operator framework, and is that related to this? The answer is definitely yes. So the code that I demoed does not use the operator SDK yet. Uh, I think when it was written for Container Linux, it basically predates the operator SDK. So the... Yeah, the SDK and the operator framework and idea have seen a lot of traction grow. As, and again, it's a way to manage your applications. But at a technical level today, it doesn't use that, but it uses the same ideas, if that makes sense. And uh, as we move forward, especially with the next-gen OpenShift 4 and tech, merge tectonic components, you're going to see increasing use of the operator SDK there um, to make sure that everything's consistent as a way to manage all the components of your cluster. My question. So you've spoken about uh, Fedora and you've spoken about Red Hat Enterprise Linux. What about CentOS? Okay. Where is that going to fit into this whole scheme? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, what about CentOS? That is a complicated question. So again, CentOS today, since it was acquired is kind of the wrong word, but brought into the Red Hat family. Um, one of the things that, one rule that CentOS serves is it's where we publish the source code for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So now it's tricky though because Red Hat Core OS is technically lifecycled with OpenShift. So it's likely that we'll be publishing our source code through OpenShift, although that's not completely defined yet. So it's, it's likely that we'll at least have CentOS in that rule. Now one thing I would... I don't think we are initially going to work on making a CentOS version of Core Red Hat Core OS, but it, it, yeah, I, I can't say that. we'll definitely publish the source code, but whether we'll try and emphasize that versus because I think the thing is Fedora Core OS as much as possible to serve that rule because you really want your host to be newer, and this is a sort of tension with the Red Hat Enterprise Linux model versus containers, right? In Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the operating system kernel lives with all the user space and the apps, but you really want to have the host be newer. And now, so to me, like I always wanted in the atomic world people to run. Uh, Fedora Atomic Host and now Fedora Core OS to make sure you have the newest versions rather than CentOS, which is older. So it, that's a very complicated question. Um, I, I guess the short answer is to be determined, but uh, I hope not to add too much complexity to the graph of operating system families, if that makes sense. Dan? Uh, so is... 
the versioning going to be different? So there's not going to be a version Fedora 28 version and a Fedora 29 version of CoreOS, correct? Okay, so the question was about operating system versioning. So obviously, uh, today, you know, Fedora has major version numbers, and actually, Fedora Atomic Host is today life cycled with Fedora itself. Um, whereas, again, Container Linux really doesn't, you don't think about that version number today. You install it, and it does have a version, but it's just kind of been a long live stream. So that is still to be determined to a degree, I think. I think that we need to capture, again, that user experience of Container Linux where you don't have to think too much about the operating system because you've containerized your applications and you can go to the newer kernel and newer systemd with less fear. I think uh, having a stronger, more focused integration testing story will allow us to move in a longer single stream. Uh, I guess this sort of classic example is Python 3. You know, like, and that's something where that may happen across a Fedora major version. And if you're writing an application, you care a lot about that. But as far we don't want you to use Python for managing a host, right? So there you don't care about the host version. So that's still to be determined. And so, honestly, is the version number for Red Hat Core OS. I think it's likely to be four, right, which will be the next OpenShift version. But um, so it's a very tricky problem because, again, we have we need to think about how people think about changes in Fedora itself, which Fedora Core OS will be derived from. But we don't want to give the impression that you may have to reprovision every six months. Right? We'd like to have a long life cycle for an install, uh, at, at least from an operator perspective, a, a sysadmin perspective. Any other questions? All right, I think that's it. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Colin. Um, so we now have a lunch break, which will be served in Ziskin Lounge. And hope to see you at 1. Thanks.